Welcome to Colorectal Cancer, Cancer Canada's first panel session of this conference entitled Revolution in Drug Discovery and How This Impacts Clinical Trials. We've chosen to include the word revolution in the title of this session as our expert panel will show us how the future of the pharmaceutical industry is being reimagined and reshaped with a highly innovative oncology drug pipeline. This, of course, will have significant implications on the future of clinical trials. Today, we have five executives from five leading and global pharmaceutical companies to share thoughts on how their organizations will be contributing to this revolution. Jennifer Chan is Vice President, Policy and Government Affairs at Merck Canada, Inc., and is responsible for the company's team of government relations and public affairs specialists. Alexandra Chambers is Manager Health Policy and Patient Access, National Oncology Policy at Novartis. Prior to joining Novartis, Alexandra was the Director of CADIS Pan-Canadian Oncology Review, which conducts, of course, HTAs for new oncology drugs. Michelle Kevin is Senior medical advisor for the Solid Tumor Pipeline at Amgen Canada. In this role, she works directly with Amgen's global clinical development teams to provide Canadian input into clinical trial development uh, programs and clinical trial designs. Before joining Amgen, Michelle was the head of clinical research operations and regional monitoring team at GlaxoSmithKline. Dr. Shurjil Shudri is the Senior Vice President and Head of Medical and Scientific Affairs for Bayer Inc. Prior to joining Bayer, Dr. Shudri was an Assistant Professor in the Departments of Medical Microbiology and Internal Medicine at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. He was also the Director of the AIDS Program at the St. Boniface General Hospital in Winnipeg and the Manitoba Satellite Director for the Canadian HIV Canadian uh, Clinical Trials Network. Dr. Henry Conter is a strategic health care partner at Hoffman La Roche Canada, uh, designing patient focused healthcare solutions that matter to them. He continues as a practicing medical oncologist, hematologist at William Osler Health System, and an adjunct professor at the University of Western Ontario Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. Our panel will be expertly guided by Neil Palmer, a pharmaceutical industry consultant with more than 30 years of pharmaceutical pricing and market access experience. He's a senior strategic advisor with PDCI Market Access, Canada's leading pricing and reimbursement consultancy that he co-founded in 1996. PDCI was acquired by McKesson Canada in December of 2020. Prior to PDCI, Neil worked with the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board. Neil, I'll pass it over for you to lead today's panel. Thank you very much. And, and I'm really, uh, really thankful for being invited to participate uh, on this panel because it, it really treats a really, a, a, a very important area in terms of evidence gathering for new oncology technologies. Uh, and 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 you know, the 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 challenge that we're we're going to be discussing today is something that's been continuing for many years, uh, and and is even more important than ever given the innovative new technologies, oncology treatments uh, that are coming to market. And so the problem has been that we're, we've been living in what I call the randomized controlled trial paradigm. Uh, and this dates back to the early days of health technology assessment, uh, where the, the standard uh, for clinical evidence, the gold standard for clinical evidence is the randomized controlled trial. And for many treatments, uh, this, this, uh, the, the RCT, randomized controlled trial, or, or RCT, uh, produces uh, the, the you know, inadequate amount of evidence to make uh, decisions both for regulatory approval as well as assessing the uh, health technology from a, a clinical and cost effectiveness perspective. Uh, but increasingly, with innovative new technologies, it's important to look at, uh, look beyond uh, randomized controlled trials. And you know, thinking back to uh, even in, in the uh, in the 2000s, and uh, I, I think of uh, Professor Sir Michael Rollins, who was the uh, chairman of NICE, the HTA body in the UK, 
and who made the statement in, in, a, in a very important uh, presentation that he gave, he made the statement that evidence hierarchies are illusory. And for many years, and, and even to this day, randomized control trials are often put at the top of an evidence hierarchy. Uh, and the other evidence, medical uh, and clinical evidence that's particularly important, such as observational data and data contained in, in, uh, in registries and real world evidence have been uh, not considered in any active way by about both regulators and health technology agency bodies that, that in Canada would include CADETH and NS. And, and from an oncology perspective, uh, the PCODER uh, group at uh, uh, the PCODER program at CADETH. And this, this began to change somewhat uh, with the advent of early scientific advice in around the same time in, in the late 2000s. And early scientific advice was something that was pioneered by Novartis uh, in a project that I was uh, lucky enough to participate in, uh, where Novartis approached many of the HTA bodies and asked, well, look, you know, we have these products coming down the, in the pipeline. Uh, we'd like some advice for you in terms of how these trials should be structured so that uh, we can gather the, 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 the appropriate amount of, of evidence the appropriate type and amount of evidence uh, for an HTA review. And this eventually expanded to include the regulators. So, uh, you know, for, for drug approval uh, in a market as well as health technology assessment and early scientific advice programs are well established uh, in, in, many, uh, in many jurisdictions, including Canada. But still the randomized control trial stays at the top of this, uh, of this evidence hierarchy. And it's always been challenging to convince uh, uh, particularly uh, health technology assessment bodies of the usefulness uh, and the importance of other sources of evidence, including observational data registries, and in increasingly things like uh, real world evidence and, and perhaps the, uh, uh, the advent of artificial intelligence that can use large, large, that can analyze large, large data sets uh, for, for purposes of not only identifying potential patients, but for, for, uh, analyzing uh, clinical evidence in a really meaningful way. And you know, we've also seen with the, with the uh, COVID outbreak that in fact, when, when, when there's sufficient motivation and resources that real world evidence can be used on a daily day, on, on a, on a, on a, uh, in a meaningful way, as it is with COVID in, in monitoring uh, the progression of the disease, the effectiveness of vaccines. You can go on your website on, on websites every day and examine the effect and, and look at data on the effectiveness of vaccines. And when I looked at the Ottawa one today, uh, there's a statement that uh, that uh, the vaccines with uh, with vaccines vaccinated people or unvaccinated people are eight times more likely to contract COVID than, than uh, vaccinated people. So there's real world evidence that's live and available, and it's been you know, actively embraced uh, by, by, uh, by the healthcare system uh, with this, with the, with the COVID uh, pandemic. And, but it needs, when we look at the advent of, uh, of really innovative new oncology treatments and the personalized medicines and the new uh, uh, the new um, pathways for care, uh, and and so it's not the traditional take a pill, but everything from CAR T to to gene therapy to uh, to to immunology. There's there's so many different types of new therapies, and the 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 traditional evidence review process is 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 uh, is not up to the mark anymore in terms of being able to provide uh, rapid reviews. Uh, that that were, were reviews that are going to provide rapid access for patients, and so we need a meaningful, inclusive engagement in design of these trials, and uh, that that includes you know not only the HDA bodies but also patients and drug plans and the entire healthcare system, frankly, as well as the manufacturer trial sponsor to design and implement trials that are going to lead to more rapid access for patients for these innovative technologies. And I'm really thrilled that that today, because to, we're going to hear from five different. Uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies that, that have some really innovative new technologies, and they're going to share their experiences in terms of, uh, of, of uh, you know, what's, what's been working and, and the challenges they see going forward. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to, uh, to uh, Michelle Kavine at uh, Amgen, 
and she's going to discuss how Amgen and the clinical trial investigators, investigators have delivered uh, Zotorosib, a targeted therapy, in less than three years from first patient dose to regulatory approval, and highlight some of the innovative approaches to make this happen. I'll pass. With that, I'll pass it over to Michelle. Great. Thank you, Neil. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak on how Amgen's uh, pipeline is shaping the future of drug development in oncology. Uh, this is certainly a fast-paced uh, area. And I think Satorasib uh, targeted therapy for KRAS G12C is a good example of uh, how innovation uh, was instrumental in getting this, uh, cutting down the time from discovery to regulatory approval. Uh, it's been by far the fastest um, development program in Amgen's history. And as we all know, uh, with more traditional drug uh, development um, approaches, it takes on average 10 years to get a drug from discovery uh, to uh, approval for patients. And in this case, the initial decision to, um, to advance the molecule that would become Satorasib um, was made in November 2017. And then even within the year, uh, we had started our first in human studies. And it took, as you mentioned, Neil, three years uh, or less than three years to go from that first patient being dosed uh, to um, regulatory approval. And this would not have happened if it wasn't for innovation innovation uh, in things such as um, adaptive uh, trials and uh, as well as the use of real-world evidence to uh, inform the trial designs and to complement uh, the clinical data package. Uh, so both of these really did play a key role in the development of this uh, tumor agnostic uh, therapy. So you can well imagine uh, the development uh, uh, program for this molecule is extremely complex. We're exploring uh, several different uh, drug combinations uh, and 13 uh, tumor types. And uh, with a tumor um, agnostic uh, molecule, it's really critical to uh, make informed decisions in a timely manner uh, as to which kind of tumors to prioritize as soon as your data and results uh, become available. So real world uh, evidence and complex innovative trial designs are, were the tools that we use to enable this process. So. Uh, starting with our first in human study, we called it uh, CODEBREAK 100. Uh, Real-world evidence helped us uh, better understand the patient population and prevalence of this mutation. And then it formed a trial design and led the to the development of an adaptive uh, basket study that had four different branches across uh, different uh, solid uh, tumor types. Uh, also, the protocol was designed in such a way that it allowed a seamless transition um, from phase one to phase two, and thereby enabling the accelerated advancement of uh, the lung cancer cohort, uh, followed by an early submission to, um, to, the, to Health Canada. Uh, so this initial regulatory approval is really just the first step as we're now turning our attention to advancing the development in other uh, solid tumors and combination therapy. And we're doing this with a, a very large master uh, protocol. It's um, called CodeBreak 101. And uh, it's also an innovative study. It's assessing multiple combinations. Um, tumor types and patient subgroups under this one master protocol. So there's currently 13 sub uh, protocols or branches in the study, and uh, it's designed to inform uh, which interventions uh, to bring forward for uh, to phase two and three uh, registrations, uh, registration enabling studies uh, as early as possible, but also uh, designed to uh, let us know which sub protocols are not maybe as promising either due to lack of efficacy or, or safety concerns. Concerns. Uh, so from a design and operational perspective, master protocols are quite complex. Uh, they require um, us to partner with other companies uh, for the combination partners. In some of the cohorts, it's novel, novel combinations, uh, which in itself can pose some uh, concerns or, or risk in the sense that you have to demonstrate uh, single agent uh, efficacy. Uh, these types of, of study are also require very uh, complex statistical modeling and uh, statistical analysis plan. They have a lot of uh, it, it, um, interim analyses and futility analyses. And then for investigators, I mean, and their staff running these studies can be incredibly cumbersome and uh, extremely time and resource intensive. 
Uh, fortunately, there has been an increase in the use of these types of studies uh, recently, and regulators from around the world, uh, including Health Canada, are increasingly recognizing complex and innovative, innovative trials as um, important tools in the development of, uh, of uh, drugs. And the FDA, for example, has a innovative or um, has a complex trial design pilot in place, whereby companies that have been have to be under to undergo under this pilot can uh, have increased engagement with the regulators on uh, even before the trials are designed and set on the you know to get feedback on trial design as well as methodology. Uh, there's also a lot of collaboration amongst the regulators and uh, Health Canada's review of Soturacive was part of uh, the FDA's Project Orbis initiative, which is a, an international uh, pilot program that's designed to give cancer patient a, a faster access to cancer therapies. Uh, however, speeding up the clinical development to secure early regulatory approval is only part of that solution and getting innovative to getting innovative treatments to patients. And although Sotorsa was granted conditional approval based on the single arm phase two uh, study, the challenges remain in providing access to patients. And there's very few, uh, as Neil mentioned, uh, examples of successful HTA reviews that are based on non-comparative studies with surrogate endpoints. So I just want to close by saying that innovation in science is meaningless if ultimately patients can't access the drugs. It is therefore incumbent on all of us, the, the private sector and public sector, to come together and partner and find some solutions to address the widening gap between regulatory and uh, access timelines and to ensure that Canadian patients have access to safe and effective treatments uh, as quickly as possible. So I'll pass it back on to you, Neil. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. Uh, next is uh, Jennifer Chan, who's uh, uh, going to speak to us. Uh, she's from Merck Canada. And she's going to speak about how advancements in the oncology pipeline are resulting in earlier and more combination treatment options for patients. Uh, yet we need to, uh, and, and the need for our healthcare systems to rapidly embrace this innovation and apply flexibility that we've seen, and I, as I mentioned, with COVID-19 in, into the oncology realm so that patients can benefit from the earliest possible access to promising treatments. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you so much, Neil. And it's a pleasure to be joining all of my industry colleagues on this panel. And thank you to Barry Stein for your leadership and the entire team at Colorectal Cancer for organizing this really important conference. So. As Neil indicated, uh, this is a very exciting, but also a very challenging time for cancer therapy. And it's also a time of great opportunity for us to really come together and make important positive changes. And we really need to seize um, this opportunity. So first, I think some of the reasons for excitement. So the oncology pipeline at Merck and at other companies, as we're gonna hear on this panel today, is very strong. And this is really thanks to the flood of all the new knowledge in the recent years. And we're moving as fast as possible to take those promising ideas and then turn them into technologies that will improve and uh, extend lives. Our Merck oncology pipeline is really evolving towards more earlier treatments for cancer with combination therapies. And this is very exciting for patients who can be treated earlier in their disease and then potentially um, have positive outcomes that will help them return to their daily activities and have less risk of recurrence. Now, another big reason I think for hope and excitement is coming from what we've seen um, with the COVID-19 pandemic and specifically We've seen everyone at every stage of the drug and vaccine development was really forced, frankly, to adapt many of our processes and our procedures for optimum speed without compromising safety. And so as a result, we saw huge innovations that happened that have led to development and testing of COVID-19 drugs and vaccines really at uh, a record pace. And so the pandemic has really shown us that positive change can occur but it also highlights um, one of our biggest challenges. And this is you know, how to transfer these learnings to other fields and especially to our number one long-term health issue and that's cancer. And we really do need to fight cancer like we fought COVID-19. So with agility and determination. And as we've heard the concept of a cancer moonshot, I think really needs to be adopted in Canada as it's going to determine how we can translate the scientific progress into real patient benefit as quickly as possible. And in order for patients to benefit, we need our regulatory, 
our HTA and our healthcare systems to really adapt with that same flexibility, exactly as they've shown they can for COVID. So one example that I, I wanted to uh, talk about is, so what happens, for example, HTA processes require overall survival data for a new cancer therapy that's already shown its effectiveness by other measures. So this, this, you know, kind of meeting this overall survival data, this could add three or more plus years um, to the time that it would take for this new treatment to reach patients. So this would be a huge uh, drawback. And so I think there are much more creative and flexible ways to meet the needs of HTA processes and, and uh, for payers as well, without disadvantaging the patients who can benefit greatly. And so we could use, for example, surrogate outcome greater degree. And the concept of this promise of value um, that, that we apply here uh, actually in, in Quebec, where the evidence is collected as it's used in the real world, it can actually drive to better outcomes uh, for cancer patients. And ultimately, you know, um, you know, companies, I know for all of my colleagues on the panel today, uh, and payers, we must work together to be more creative in developing new ways to resolve uncertainty for payers while getting the treatments to patients as soon as possible. And I think the same type of innovation and thinking and the flexibility is also needed to improve and widen the net of cancer screening programs. So particularly if we have new treatments that are effective fighting early stage cancers, um, for example, um, it's really encouraging to see in some of our largest provinces, like Ontario, now having lung cancer screening programs for those uh, most at risk. And so we really do need to make the cancer screening system more accessible and comprehensive. And I think there are surely learnings from, you know, the widespread system of COVID-19 screening that's actually been put in place across Canada. And so one idea, again, uh, for example, would be to expand those testing facilities into permanent locations that can also um, offer cancer screening tests. Now, as for clinical trials, the COVID lockdown really has forced some speedy, but also ultimately some positive changes in how we've been conducting our clinical trials, and such as the use, uh, the greater use of technology to enroll the patients and the use of virtual consultations and data collection. And we can build on these changes by considering how technology can actually transform the clinical trial operations rather than uh, than just simply like replicating our traditional processes. And I think other countries can also show us some positive ways forward too as well. Um, when we look back, Italy was um, one of the European countries first hit most severely by the pandemic. And um, they rapidly developed new ways to conduct studies that I think really should be considered for longer term use. Um, we also saw the United Kingdom, um, they benefited from having an existing clinical research network that was embedded in its national health service. And I think this really helped them to quickly deploy trial protocols in every facility, including at the community hospital level, and really speeding up patient recruitment for COVID-19 studies. And I think Canada um, really needs to learn from such examples. So ultimately, I think technology allows us to think of new ways to make cancer trials more efficient um, by more quickly accessing the eligible patients in more locations. And um, it's also really encouraging to see that ASCO has already uh, published some recommendations um, to achieve this uh, from the learnings of the pandemic. So in summary, I think we, we all need to you know, combine technology, combine the learnings from the pandemic to come up with much better ways uh, to do things that will ultimately um, benefit uh, Canadian patients. So thank you um, and, and back to you, Neil. Uh, thanks, uh, Jennifer. We'll pass. We'll now move over to uh, to Alexander Chambers, who uh, will uh, be uh, discussing uh, their uh, Novartis's experience with CAR T and Kimraya, and uh, and uh, uh, as well as uh, their engagement in the HTA and uh, regulatory review process. And uh, I'll pass it over to you, Alexander. Great. Thanks very much, Neil. And uh, thanks to everyone for uh, watching us today and, and to Colorectal Cancer Canada for, for the invitation for this, uh, for this session today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So as Neil just mentioned, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about the experience that Novartis had bringing uh, CAR T cell therapy to Canada. I think it was a, a really challenging uh, situation and a really disruptive innovation that was going to enter the system. And and I you know I think there's some really great lessons to be learned from from that experience. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about the HTA review and then next uh, about the implementation. So. 
the HTA reviews that were done by Cadeth and Ines, they took a different path than the than the traditional reviews that had been done for drugs. And I, and I think this was really uh, clever um, by the by the the system who had demanded that you know these CAR T therapies be treated differently than just just um, any other any other drug in the system. And what I thought was really interesting when those recommendations came out for the CAR T cell therapy, it wasn't as much you know is this a yes or a no recommendation, but it was more of a how. And I thought that was different in in sort of and the approach that had been taken you know versus the positive positive or negative recommendation it was you know recognition that there is a lot of promise in these car t cell therapies and how are we going to introduce them into the system so when looking at the CADIS recommendation, it was, you know, talking about making sure there was equitable access, talking about clear eligibility criteria, and then also talking about more data collection, recognizing, you know, that we, that, you know, there were some uncertainties in the data and that further data collection was necessary. And in the Ines recommendation, it was very similar to the CADIS recommendation, except Ines took it one step further. And they said that they wanted to reevaluate the CAR T cell therapies within three years. And so it was that opportunity that really, you know, opened the door to this idea of coverage with evidence development and really trying to find a way for patients to access a therapy that was very promising, that was disruptive to the system, and finding a way to collect that evidence to demonstrate the value that the that the therapy offered. And so Novartis was able to partner with some centers in in Quebec to to uh, collect some of those data and that and that work is still still ongoing um, and and you know it remains to be seen you know how Ines will reevaluate but just the fact that they went as far to say that they wanted to reevaluate is really new in the system and I think very important you know to recognize that the system was able to to do this for the CAR T cell therapy. So how can we replicate that for other therapies? And now I just want to talk a little bit on the on the implementation side of things. And I will um, acknowledge that within Novartis, I have not been involved in the implementation. Is the heavy lifting has all gone uh, along with my with my colleagues, but I have. Um, spoken with them and and I know there have been a handful of panel sessions since uh, CAR T therapy was introduced where we've had you know payers on a panel clinicians patient groups and industry all sitting on these panels and acknowledging that because there was a common goal there was a pathway forward and you know there have there's definitely been challenges with the implementation of the CAR T cell therapy but that we found our way. And I think, you know, and I know Michelle uh, talked about it in her uh, part as well, talking about partnerships and this, this need to be able to work together. And I think with the CAR T cell therapy, there was a recognition that we had to find a way forward. And so there was that willingness to work together to, to make those steps and, and get us to the point where we, where we could actually be able to offer this therapy to patients, to patients in Canada. So, you know, that's just one example example again you know it's obviously this wouldn't apply to every situation but a recognition of how could we how could we do this moving forward and I think there's this is a great example of how it has worked in the past and I think it could definitely be applied to other situations uh, moving forward so I think I'll just leave it there Neil and thanks for the opportunity thanks very much Alex and now we're going to pass it over to uh uh, Shurjil Shudri at Bayer, and he's going to focus on Bayer's experience and learnings from the approvals and launch of radiopharmaceuticals as well as tumor agnostic precision oncology drugs. Uh, Shurjil, over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Neil, and uh, thank you to Colorectal Cancer for giving me the opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, I uh, want to share some experiences, lessons learned from the launch of our radio pharmaceutical and, uh, and our precision oncology therapy. For, for Bayer, oncology is a key area of our research and development. And Canada is a really important country for the clinical development activities that we have. 
we have three key areas of, of research in oncology targeted for radiopharmaceuticals, uh, really focusing on thorium conjugates, um, precision oncology, as well as uh, next generation immuno oncology and uh, cell based therapies. So, the first example I want to share is uh, radium 223, which is a radiopharmaceutical uh, targeted to treating. Uh, prostate cancer that is metastatic to the bone. And, and uh, due to the nature of this product, it did not go through reimbursement uh, through CADETS. It really was uh, a discussion with each individual province and really with each individual institution that administers uh, radiopharmaceuticals. We had to certify uh, hospitals to do this. We had to really look at the ecosystem in terms of who the the parties involved were, because this was a fairly unique product, where the prescribing physician was not the one who was administering it. That you had involvement of urologists, oncologists, uh, nuclear medicine specialists, and radiation oncologists. So it was quite complex, and and it really had to be sort of mapped uh, hospital by hospital to ensure that the structures were in. And were in place to administer, both prescribe and administer this product. For larotrectinib, our precision oncology therapy, um, it's a tumor agnostic product, and um, it essentially targets uh, an NTRK gene fusion. So, any any patient who has this gene fusion potentially is uh, eligible for for therapy. Uh, but it, this was really the first time that the re uh, reimbursement agencies were looking at this product. And I have to say, we did get a successful outcome at CADETS, but it took some time and effort, and uh, there were a lot of lessons learned for us uh, in terms of how to do this the next time, the types of data that we need. Because uh, when you're looking at a tumor agnostic product, and I think Neil mentioned this already, it doesn't really fit the current treatment paradigm. Um, typically, you have an oncology product that is prescribed for a very specific tumor, often a very specific line of therapy by an oncologist who specializes in, in treating those types of tumors. When you have a tumor agnostic product, um, it could be prescribed by any oncologist as long as the, the tumor they're treating has the, uh, the specific gene fusion. And it meant that we really had to uh, to educate and make aware uh, the entire oncology community about uh, the availability of this product, what it did. Uh, the treatment pathways had to be mapped out because they were different for different tumor types. Most importantly, uh, it was really important to have the diagnostics available and um, to, to make sure that clinicians knew that uh, they, they needed to really look for this gene fusion in order to have this treatment option available for patients. So, so we had to really look at how do we establish those diagnostic pathways? And it's not as simple as just going to the oncologist. We had to work with the lab directors, pathologists. And these were quite unique challenges. Um, it also really highlighted, and I think this has been mentioned already, the need for really collecting real-world evidence, the natural history of the disease in patients with this type of gene fusion, because that was important uh, to get our uh, reimbursement approval, uh, the epidemiology to better characterize just how frequent uh, this, uh, uh, this type of gene fusion was and the number of patients who'd be eligible for treatment. So all of these are really important lessons for future products that don't completely fit into the normal treatment paradigm, whether these are radiopharmaceuticals or precision oncology therapeutics. Um, it speaks to the need for really looking at the Canadian uh, health infrastructure to make sure that it is ready for these new innovations, that um, it's easy and smooth to slot these into the, the, the new um, therapeutic protocols that the the diagnostic testing is available and, and, and that there's no duplication. I, ideally, it would be good to have one systematic approach so that 
uh, when there's tissue available from a patient is tested for all available um, targets for precision oncology. So different companies are now trying to duplicate uh, these diagnostic pathways. And all of this uh, will hopefully help improve uh, treatment of uh, uh, Canadians uh, with, uh, with cancer. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll pass it back to Neil. Sorry, uh, we're going to pass it now over to Henry Conter, who's going to uh, give us the perspective uh, from Roche Canada. Thank you so much for giving, the giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today. I'm going to share with you a very personal story about why clinical trials is so important to me and how we're approaching uh, this problem at Roche. When I first became a medical oncologist and started practicing about um, a number of years ago now, I was six, month into my, six months into my practice and I was approached to launch a uh, clinical trial in relapse refractory lymphoma. And for those of you who don't know, relapse refractory lymphoma is a very difficult disease to treat. It was even harder to treat back then. Um, essentially, patients in this circumstance knew that they didn't have long left to live. And this is why we felt that this clinical trial in particular was so important. But when we looked at the trial itself, it was extremely complicated and very difficult for patients. Nonetheless, um, this was my first opportunity to be a, a PI, and so I opened the trial. We had a very difficult time recruiting to this trial because it was so difficult. And at least initially, uh, we weren't sure if it was the right, uh, the right thing for us to have opened. But I'll never forget, I got a phone call from a friend of mine um, who was a, a medical oncologist in, uh, in another city uh, who had a patient in his 40s, three kids, all daughters, all young, and he desperately wanted something to not only help him, but help other patients like him. And he talked to me on the phone. He knew what he was getting into, and he came all the way up to, uh, to Brampton uh, weekly to receive infusions. And then a second time, always the day afterwards, to do additional questionnaires uh, and blood tests. This was extremely difficult for him. And although he continued to reassure me throughout his treatment that he knew what he was getting into, he wanted the therapy, I got this terrible sense that we really let him down. He died within a few months. The trial shortly thereafter closed and the results of that trial were insufficient to make any conclusive um, statements about this. I think that this trial highlights why partnerships, uh, deep partnerships with industry, patients, payers, and other healthcare stakeholders are going to become increasingly important and why the way in which we've done things in the past um, isn't going to be the way in which we need to do things in the future. At Roche right now, for example, we have 25 new molecular entities that are coming through our portfolio, and a third of them are using new mechanisms of action uh, and new modalities of therapy completely, including bispecifics and cancer vaccines that have never been uh, shown to be a benefit in, in humans before. In order to make sure that these drugs actually provide value as quickly as possible, we're going to need to develop new ways of gathering information and new endpoints. And so, for example, at Roche, right now, 90% of our late phase clinical trials includes patient reported outcomes and health related quality of life questionnaires. But we don't fully know what the value, what the value of those outcomes will be to our partners on the health technology assessment side or on the payer side, because we don't have that kind of deep partnership that would be required in order to co-design these kinds of clinical trials right from day one. 
Now at Roche, we are completely redesigning the way in which we conduct business in order to uh, make way for this new reality. So Roche is, for example, becoming a healthcare solutions company rather than a traditional pharmaceutical company. Um, for those of you who don't know, Roche does have a pharmaceutical, a diagnostics and a diabetes uh, division, but we're completely rethinking what it means to be a healthcare company. And so rather than um, having people go out into the field and talk explicitly about drugs or try and think through how to get um, drugs into the hands of patients, we're really looking at the healthcare system holistically in order to ensure that patients not only get access to new therapeutics, but get the full value that those therapeutics are supposed to bring and even beyond that. What that has translated to is new initiatives. So circling back to clinical trials, rather than just doing clinical trials by themselves, we're actively partnering with provinces to think through new ways of developing evidence. So real world evidence is something that we think through regularly. And we now have a partnership in British Columbia with a protocol called PREDICT, where we are actively collecting information on a regular basis on patients in near real time to inform not only how patients are reacting to a new therapeutic, but also how they move through the entire system. What are the costs associated with that? How can those be optimized? How can patients care really be taken to the next level? The third thing that I wanna talk about though is what we need from our partners. So I already mentioned that we are making all of these, these transformations and we're coming up with these new pathways, but we don't fully understand or know how these ideas are going to be uh, received. And so in one example, Roche had actually created a complete real-world evidence uh, protocol alongside of a novel therapeutic that we presented to CADF as part of our submission, recognizing that the clinical trial that was submitted um, may not be in the traditional sense up to the, um, the methods that uh, Cadet was looking for. Unfortunately, um, that real world evidence package did not factor in any way into their decision about what to um, decide on the path forward for this drug. And as a result, um, unfortunately, um, no further evidence is being developed to either confirm or refute the findings that we had originally found in our clinical trial, despite the fact that in many other jurisdictions across the world, uh, including in the United States, uh, patients are currently uh, receiving benefit from this therapy. This isn't the way things need to be. Um, and we believe that the future is really going to revolve around that deep partnership with that true patient focus. What outcomes do patients value? How do we bring those in upfront in order to uh, ensure that those are fully represented within our clinical protocols and within the work that we do every single day? And I'll end with my own, personal, my own personal example of how this has affected my own work. As we're thinking about health solutions, we have patients at the table as decision makers alongside uh, any one of us to help guide what we incorporate within our health solutions concepts, what are the outcomes that we really need to be focusing on, and what are the things we need to do to make sure that patients really get the full value of the efforts that pharmaceutical companies and other stakeholders are currently pouring into this. Uh, and with that, Neil, I'd like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. And I'd like to let the entire colorectal uh, team know that Roche right now does have a patient portal um, called Four Patients where they can actually look up the clinical trials that we're currently conducting. Um, it provides summaries specifically for patients uh, using terms that um, most people can fully understand. And I'm hoping that this uh, methodology is something that we can really bring forward uh, so that we can transform the way clinical trials are done and, and new drugs are being developed uh, in Canada, especially. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank, thank you very much. It's uh, 
those were, were, were five very interesting uh, uh, presentations and, and uh, I think it's really going to be uh, really going to inform our, our discussion that continues on from now. I think you know, a common theme we heard in there was, was the challenges in, in convincing uh, or engaging with the, particularly the HTA uh, system, the ACADETH or an S, uh, to, to, um, to, to consider alternative uh, uh, forms of evidence, whether that's uh, evidence, you know, coverage with, you know, through coverage with evidence development uh, or you know, innovative trial designs. Uh, there was a the mention of, you know, very sophisticated statistical analyses, uh, different outcome measures, and in my experience, uh, uh, HTA, particularly CADETH, and to a certain extent, NES, are very suspicious of, of anything that doesn't that isn't sort of the traditional, uh, you know, hard outcomes of, of survival or even progression-free survival, and anything else. They're they're very suspicious of these, and and things that are or that are patient-oriented or patient-centered. Again, uh, again, the, 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 you, you get comments back about that. You know, patient evidence. You know, the, the patient reported outcomes aren't aren't evidence. Their opinions or their that kind of thing. And so, I'd really like to hear from from uh, from from the from uh, each of these panelists in terms of what in in terms of how to the extent you were successful in getting uh, Cadeth or Ines to consider, uh, you know, different types of evidence. Uh, that that that's not the traditional form of evidence. What what worked? What what was it that you know that, that convinced them that this is something that they that they should be doing and, and did do to uh, um, you know to to successfully get the product recommended and and you know what are the learnings there? So I think we touched on some of them, but I'll, I'll just go through around the table in, in the same order we started uh, before. So if I could start with the. Uh, uh, with Michelle, and maybe you can comment on that, and, and then we can go from there. S sorry, I'm just, uh, you were cutting in and out, so it might have been just me, oh, but sorry. you're asking us for examples where real world evidence did make uh, a, a, an impact on securing a positive HTA recommendation, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and, and not yes, just okay. not not just the uh, examples, okay, but thank you. what 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 worked in terms of how were you able to convince, say, CAD or Picoder to consider that types of evidence? Because historically, they've been pretty you know resistant to anything that's not the traditional form of evidence. So, what is it that would convince them to consider it and then consider it in a positive way? Um, so I think, uh, like from from Amgen's perspective, I think we were successful at one at uh, with Blincido to uh, to get our initial um, approval or sorry reimbursement in uh, acute lymphoplastic leukemia, and there was a real world uh, evidence was used as an historical control. Uh, so that was a few years back, but I mean since then I think it's been it's become I think more and more challenging. I mean this was a, a small patient population, a very high unmet need, um, and so it, it has become, uh, I think, more difficult. We're looking with Sotor Sabina targeted therapy, looking at analogs, and there's really very limited, if any, analogs where they've been successful on securing a positive HTA and subsequently uh, reimbursement based on the single arm study. So, as you say, real world evidence is really important. Uh, what we're finding as a challenge is, is just the um, to access to that real world evidence. I mean, there's a lot of, there's, there's silos, um, there's, it's difficult to determine, you know, how do you assess outcomes in these patients? It's not the same as the clinical trials outcomes in, in, uh, in oncology, where you're looking at rhesus and tumor shrinkage. It's, it's so much more complicated. And there really isn't a federated data set that you could kind of tap into and have real time uh, data to be able to close those data gaps. So I think we are, uh, this is something that we're still exploring and uh, trying to to assess, and I mean we're encouraged by seeing in initiatives such as you know there's CFIN and uh, I think Marathon of Hope that, that are moving in that direction. But it is definitely a gap, and it's affecting our ability to be able to to bring forward kind of or incorporate real world evidence. That's great, Jennifer. Thanks, Neil. So. Um... 
I think in terms of, um, and, and the theme of this is, you know, reimagining the future. So I think, you know, an area where we're seeing um, some, you know, I, I think innovative ways um, from an HTA perspective is really um, uh, here in Quebec and, you know, with our pembrolizumab, our immuno-oncology therapy uh, for cancer, this concept of um, the promise of value, um, you know, that we're seeing here in Quebec, where basically um, they'll consider the evidence as it's being collected, as it's being used in the real world. Um, I think this is a really, you know, kind of a concept, a, a move in the right direction. And I think of, um, you know, when we think about the hope and the potential of, um, you know, being able to treat cancer patients earlier, um, you know, basically, um, you know, to bring uh, innovations to them earlier in the disease to help improve their outcomes. We, we need to move away, and I think you're the one who kicked us off uh, on this panel, move away from, you know, the kind of, you know, kind of how things were done in the past about using, you know, kind of, um, you know, overall, you know, waiting for the overall survival data. We need to evolve our HTA um, and, and our payer and our HTA systems to be more agile and, and to evolve with the science now that we've got earlier treatments that we should really think about how do we, you know, move to using surrogate outcomes um, to a much more, a greater degree. And I know that this conversation is um, very live and very current, and it's, I know it's a hot topic um, amongst um, HDA bodies all around the world. But again, really to consider, um, you know, how we can use surrogate outcomes to a much greater degree, given the hope and the promise of now that we've got, you know, cancer um, therapies and can actually uh, treat patients earlier in their disease. And again, you know, we have seen some very promising concepts of, you know, using this, um, uh, you know, promise of value. Um, certainly we've seen it in Quebec. Um, but again, I think there, there's an opportunity to really look at more flexible ways um, to meet the needs of HDA processes and payers. That's great, thanks. And Alex, I know with, with CAR-T therapy, there's engaging, the need to engage, you know, so many different players in the healthcare system uh, to make this work. And so maybe you can just comment on what was what what worked so well there, and and I think you know I think there's also a focus in this this panel to think a little bit about how how patients can be engaged in the process. So maybe you could comment on that as well. Absolutely, and I think yeah, I was definitely um, thinking uh, how patients and clinicians engage in the HTA process, I think has a has a really big impact. And, you know, I can think back to uh, Novartis uh, product, uh, Tafenlar Mechanist for lung cancer, and there was a submission several years ago. And through the input, it was it was more of a it came through as more of a, a nice to have as opposed to a must have. And I think when you've got, you know, a lot of uncertainty in data, it's those uh, clinician and patient perspectives really can drive an HTA recommendation. And, and you know, recently uh, Novartis um, made another submission. And again, in this case, you know, the clinicians and patient groups were very adamant of how important this therapy was, especially in this age of targeted therapies. And again, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty in the data. We had an opportunity to use real world evidence as well. But I think, I think having those voices uh, be able to contribute to the HTA process is really important. And, and if I can just tag on to something Jennifer had just said, I listened to a, a talk last week talking about surrogate outcomes from a patient perspective in disease-free survival and how meaningful disease-free survival can be for patients. You know, you know, do we, must we continue to look at overall survival when it actually is quite meaningful, some of these other surrogate outcomes as well. So I, I really think it's important to be listening to, to what's important to patients. Thanks. And, and Sergio, you mentioned uh, radio pharmaceuticals, and that's, you know, brings up a whole new challenges of having to go hospital by hospital, presumably to, to get, uh, you know, funding for this, to this, these, these new technologies and convincing a, a range of healthcare uh, um, players within each of those, those institutions, not to mention the, sort of the overall cat at the recommendations and, and, and NAS in Quebec. Uh, to what extent did patients really, uh, with a patient perspective, come into that? And, it did, and, and, and to, to what extent was that successful to in incorporating the, the patient perspective? Yeah. 
if it wasn't for the patient and clinician engagement, I don't think we would have been successful. As you said, Neil, I think for radio pharmaceuticals, this is fairly unique because it's not just the cost of the actual treatment. The, the hospitals needed to, to actually cover the cost for, for administering it because they typically for radio pharma, you know, they're, they're used to using these uh, agents for diagnosis, not for treatment. And, and the systems were not set up uh, to have patients come in and to have these administered as therapeutics. So that's an area we had to navigate. I, I think the one thing I, I wanted to highlight, and it's, uh, every panel member has said this already, in particular for our precision therapy, real world evidence was really important. We were fortunate that we could get some of these data from the US because their patients had continued on therapy. There were longer term outcomes available and more patients we could really look at the epidemiology and natural history. But as we move forward, as these new precision therapy agents are approved, you can only get real world evidence when the drug is actually available and being used to treat patients. So, so it's really, really important to expedite the process of getting it to patients so we can really look at that natural history of how patients respond, what those outcomes are. Um, so I think the system needs to really accommodate that and and allow for getting early approvals through. Both Health Canada, I think they do a really good job, but also uh, the uh, HTA, so that we can actually see in real time how these uh, products are performing and, and, and use that actually to really determine the value uh, to the patients. Great, thanks. And and Henry, did, do you have uh, what can you add to this conversation in terms of, uh, particularly you know the real world evidence and getting patient. And I, you know, I think in your your presentation you mentioned this and you know how important this can be in in terms of what you see that can be successful in in helping uh, getting these products to patients fast and you know more rapidly. How can we engage patients and and have a you know a truly patient centered uh, an analysis and assessment. How can we convince the HTA bodies to uh, to uh, to consider that? Well, when I listen to everyone, you know, the common theme in all of this is really uncertainty. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty from the pharmaceutical industry and from patients and clinicians about what what types of evidence um, HTA bodies will accept in any given circumstance. And you know, first of all, I want to be clear. You know, I have utmost respect for Cadith. I worked there myself and I met Alex at Cadith. So uh, I, I like uh, Cadith for that reason as well on a personal level. Um, but you can kind of point to these one-offs. And so at Roche, for example, we we just received a very, uh, very positive recommendation for Rosley Trek in Ross 1 lung cancer, a very uh, rare type of, uh, of lung cancer. Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of worry that that we would not get that recommendation, and on the other hand, we can point to a number of instances where randomized trials have actually shown overall survival advantage, and Cadith has actually decided against reimbursing um, uh, those agents. And in fact, one example where an overall survival advantage was demonstrated, and Cadith said no. And then subsequently, in a very similar circumstance, almost identical circumstance, Cata subsequently said yes. And so these are all areas where, you know, you can point to this you know, huge amount of uncertainty. And so I think real world evidence is absolutely critical to how we're going to reduce the amount of uncertainty that exists for payers and for HTA bodies. But what form that real world evidence actually takes in terms of the data collection and the analysis, that's where we need a lot of guidance for how to reduce our own uncertainty. So at Roche, you know, we, we uh, recently made huge investments into our Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence, uh, which is a consortium of AI centers across uh, Canada, which we're very optimistic will help us to better understand which patients will, will benefit from, uh, from new therapies. Uh, and we believe that they'll probably be able to do that in a faster way and a more accurate way than 
the, the traditional method of analyzing real world evidence. But given how advanced artificial intelligence really has become and how far away it is from um, the expertise that CADF and the members of CADF, myself included in that, have traditionally developed, how will they actually react to that? I don't know. And, and I think that's why I think it does circle back to, to my presentation around a deep need for partnerships. This, this kind of barrier or, or these you know, explicit time points where you can have only limited discussions, I think that's the part that really needs to be pushed towards the wayside. I think everyone should be able to agree on that. We need to be able to really work together so that way we know exactly where to invest and how to invest to make sure that we're meeting the needs of, of everyone. Great. Well, thank, thanks very much, everyone. I, I see we're at, at time. And I'll pass it back to Anne-Marie uh, for, for next steps. Thank you, Neil. And thank you so much to the panel. Neil, you did a brilliant and expert job facilitating a great deal of highly in-depth information. Um, thank you also to Jennifer, Alexandra, Michelle, Sergio, and Henry for their uh, tremendously um, uh, insightful comments uh, to inform the conversation today. We're going to go now to uh, some of the questions that we hope have come through, the uh, question facilitation on the platform. So I'm gonna stop. One of the questions that has come through the platform is that given the significance of the uh, changes in the drug pipeline and into the future is what are those key things that we need to think about as they relate to the clinical trial process? What are the things that fundamentally need to change? How should organizations organize around changes in the clinical pro trial process as the pipeline gets reimagined? If we could just get 30, a quick 30 second input from each of uh, our panelists, that would be tremendous. Alexandra, may we start with you? Sure, uh, and thanks Thanks for that question. So, you know, if just quickly three things that, that come to mind, and I think we've touched on it already, is this idea of patient involvement. So all the way through the, the process, right from uh, clinical trial development, right into reimbursement, I think it's important that we're, that we're engaging and, and having uh, patients engaged all the way through. Secondly, I think we need to have an opportunity to find a way to do reevaluation. So how do, we, how do we introduce a drug early and with, that's promising and find a way to to, to reevaluate it. And then lastly, and again, it's come up quite a bit, is partnerships. How do we all work together? How does every stakeholder in the group get a seat at the table so that we're, that we're moving along and moving forward and in serving the best, uh, in the best interest of all patients? Thank you so much. Henry, would you like to go next? Thanks so much. So a few things that immediately come to mind. Uh, number one, um, real-world synthetic control arms. So Roche has uh, acquired Flatiron, which is a uh, incredibly large real-world uh, real evidence database um, where we have very granular information around the kinds of patients that have been treated in the past with a given molecule or without it. Uh, we believe that this kind of information really holds the key to understanding the full value of these therapeutics. Um, another piece, I'll echo uh, Alex's point around clinically relevant patient reported uh, outcomes. I think there's a whole host of uh, benefits that uh, are accruing to patients that are not currently being captured and, and much less recognized by, uh, by payers or by health systems. And we need to do a lot better job around designing trials along with patients to make sure that we understand the totality of the value that these new therapeutics are bringing. Um, Thank you the for last reinforcing. Thing I would, uh, is, sorry, the last thing I would mention, though, is just novel ideas around how we can um, redesign clinical trials to uh, uh, sidestep the failings as currently exist within Canada. So if Canada has a specific concern around a clinical trial, what can we do in Canada to augment that global trial? Because we can't change the world, but we can certainly change and augment what happens here at home. Thank you, Henry. Jennifer, may I go to you? 
Sure, yes, thanks so much for your question. And so I think as we're seeing the science is, you know, kind of resulting in, you know, innovative therapies that are moving towards more earlier treatments for cancer, and also with combination therapies. I really think from a clinical trial perspective, um, but also the downstream pers um, perspective of, you know, the clinical trials um, looking at really, um, you know, surrogate outcomes and the use of more use of surrogate outcomes and also making sure that, you know, we can evolve um, the HTA processes. So when the clinical trials are done with the surrogate outcomes, that the HTA process can move and evolve to more um, of modernized um, outcomes and to really look at these um, surrogate outcomes so that we can you know, bring these new cancer therapies um, you know, faster um, to patients who can benefit, uh, benefit much more greatly. And so again, I think really, um, you know, I think we've heard it from the panel today is ultimately we're all focused on driving better outcomes for cancer patients from the clinical trials to, you know, the regulatory HTM pairs. But ultimately, um, you know, this is going to take partnership and for companies um, and uh, the payers, um, HTA bodies to come together to be more creative um, in developing new ways to really um, resolve the uncertainty for pairs while getting treatments uh, to the patients as, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Sergio. Well, I just want to echo what has been said about the importance of patient engagement in trials. Uh, it, it's really been shown that if patients are involved in the trial design and conduct process, the trials actually recruit faster, the patients are more likely to stay in, in the treatment arms. And, and, and so that, that is really, really important. There's also lessons we've learned from COVID. Uh, you know, we've learned to do decentralized trials and it, it can reduce a lot of burden on patients not having to come up, come in for follow-up visits if those can be done at home. And, and then finally, I, and I think we've all talked about these really innovative therapies. Uh, there's a lot of therapies coming and there'll be need to really look at them and how they work in combination. So I think looking at innovative trial designs, adaptive trials, factorial designs, really to establish the position of each therapy and how it works in combination, I think is going to be really important as well. Thank you so much for reinforcing uh, the value and need for engaging patients. This has been a conference theme uh, for mm -hmm. the last four now five years. And Michelle, we're going to give you the last word on this question. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, I actually concur with everything that's been said by the other panelists. And uh, especially, I mean, I think the learnings from COVID, I think there's been uh, a lot of learnings that we need to carry forward around technology and remote uh, monitoring of patients and even uh, remote monitoring of the data um, at the investigator site that would decrease the burden. But uh, also, I think from a payer perspective, I think, you know, we need to develop some flexible funding models where payers are willing to share in the risk of uh, closing the data gap uh, and, you know, for example, providing a coverage with evidence generation or fixed coverage until, you know, the data reads out and matures. Great. We do have a couple more questions from the audience. And uh, in fact, there's many of these questions that have come through. One of the key ones is regarding the uh, conversation around public-private partnerships. Each of you in your own way have mentioned the high need for these. So in the brief time we have left, what would be helpful is we'll just go quickly around the table. What is the one most important thing that needs to be done to actually elevate and drive the concept of private public partnerships? How do we make them happen in a way that is going to best set everybody up for success? What's that one thing that particularly could be done in the next year or so that everyone thinks to be important? Alex, may I start with you? Uh, sure, absolutely. So um, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think when I 
think about you know what needs to happen and and again i have a a perspective where i have worked in the public sector and in the and in the private sector now i think what we need to find a way to build a little bit more trust and i think what could happen is if we had just even small projects you know could we could we start small and build upon it you know let's not let's not try to do everything at once but i think the more we can we can work together and recognize that there are some commonalities i think that's a really good place to start let's start small let's build that trust and i i think from there you can actually really see some some great partnerships grow yeah thank you especially for somebody who's been on both sides henry i know this is a passion for you you go next Yeah, so Alex definitely stole my word. Trust was going to be <laughs> my word, so thanks for that one, Alex. Um, but what I will say is, you know, to, to take that to, to, to the next level would be to really um, uh, give um, giving uh, Kadith and other partners the opportunity to really test us. You know, we have a built-up uh, desire to invest, a built-up in a desire to explore new ideas, um, so if, you know, the, the, the public sector is looking to um, move away from risk, let's think through how we can create partnerships that will bring out the best in the pharmaceutical industry and um, reduce the, uh, the, the concerns and anxieties that uh, public payers currently have, especially in our current environment. Thank you. Michelle. Michelle, we've got you on mute. It's always gonna... a tricky one. Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, so just to build on what Henry uh, mentioned about risk is, is perhaps uh, coming together and trying to find ways how we can best mitigate risks on, on both sides and, and building kind of these milestones and either how, how we get, we provide access to patients and, uh, and, and just to ensure that, uh, you know, that uh, no one, I guess there's that trust again to be able to, to come together and make sure these drugs are available for patients. Yeah, it's, it's interesting across all of the sessions how many times trust is coming up. So thank you for reinforcing that. Sergio? Yes, I was going to mention trust as well. Uh, in, in addition, I think it's important that these uh, relationships be built on long-term um, collaboration and not be transactional. You know, it takes time mm -hmm. to, it builds the trust, but I, I think it also allows the teams to really get to know each other and their uh, capabilities. And then finally, I think speed is important. It's, it's really important to be able to get new projects started. Uh, so the time needed to get service agreements in place, um, to really get everybody aligned. If it takes too long, then we lose the opportunity to do this in Canada. And I, I should mention also that the, the collaborations are already happening. We partner with yes. uh, so, so it's really not that we're not doing it, it's just how to do it even better. Right, 100% agreed. Jennifer. Yes, Carol. So I think all the panels, I echo all of their comments about, you know, the trust, the relationship, uh, the collaboration, um, the sense of urgency. And it's ultimately about putting the patient first. I think that that is, you know, all of the ecosystems, you know, kind of our universal kind of North Star. And, you know, frankly, we've seen what can happen um, in COVID when we all come together as an ecosystem, um, you know, based to move quickly and, um, you know, to basically, and we saw this with the COVID-19 vaccines and treatments, you know, they were made available to patients as soon as they were approved. And I think it's because, you know, uh, there's different ways of working, um, moving in more agile processes and because, you know, trying to get some of, you know, the upfront legwork done in terms of negotiating access so that the scope of vaccines and treatments could get to patients as soon as they were approved. So there's already concrete examples of how we can do this um, as an ecosystem. And so I think really encourage uh, to think about that and how we can apply that um, to the area of cancer patients. And as we've heard, you know, to get all of these new innovative new treatments um, as soon as they are approved um, uh, to cancer patients so that they're not disadvantaged while the HDA process and the pricing and the listing negotiations proceed. Um, and we know that can take many, many months. And we know that other countries are already uh, doing this. 
Um, so I think let, let's um, let's step up to the challenge. Yeah, thank you. We can look internationally. And Neil, you did an extraordinary job at uh, guiding a, a, a lot of information across some uh, incredibly talented people. I'll give you the last word and uh, then we'll go to break. Neil, and we have you on mute. Oh dear. Uh, That's yes. no worries. So, you know, I, I'd like to echo what we've heard about trust as well as about going incrementally. And, you know, I, I'm reminded that Ryan O'Rourke, when he was president of CATA, said, you know, we can't be partners. Uh, and so there's a real sensitivity out there. And that's probably mm -hmm. still there about, about CATA and, and government being partners with industry. Uh, and, and it's going to take some time to get to that, you know, partner partnership. Uh, uh, status, but there's no nothing to stop collaboration, cooperation, and that comes back to finding uh, specific challenges or, or projects or opportunities where where industry and patients and government and HDA bodies can work together to address specific problems. We've mentioned COVID, and I think it's really finding ways and, and finding areas. Well, there'll not there'll never be complete agreement on everything, but let's find ways where where everybody can work together towards a common goal and with the focus on the patient and getting uh, access, patient access as, as quickly as possible, because that, that everybody everybody's agreed that that's important. I'll leave it yeah, at that. Great. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. To the audience, we will uh, take a five minute break and we'll be back again. Mm -hmm.